Hello, my name is Justice Phillips. My name is Elvis. Hello, my name is Brandon Ramirez. My name is Jesus Nunez. Welcome to Power Your Story Season 7. A podcast from Ray Graham Training Center High School. This season, our theme is hobbies and light hacks. Having trouble turning on your stove? My favorite hack is when your knob is broken, grab a pair of like little tweezers and twist the knob like that if your knob is broken. Enjoy the show. Hey, it's Andrea Clunder, Program Director for Power Your Story. We couldn't let this season about hobbies go by without a little D&D action. This episode is super special because we had the amazing Chicago-based actor Andrew Sines visit our program in 2019, back when we were still producing the show in person, for a crash course in the cult classic RPG, that's role-playing game, Dungeons & Dragons. At the time, Andrew was also part of an actual play podcast of the tabletop RPG Arcane and Iron. That podcast is called Variant Rules, and though they haven't released any new content in 2021, you can definitely still check out the show in your favorite podcast app. But in this episode, you'll hear some context about Dungeons and Dragons, a sample of actual play with our student producers, followed by a Q&A. Enjoy the show. All right, guys. Well, I'm really happy to be here today. My name is Andrew Sines. I'm currently a professional downtown working. I used to be in the Chicago theater scene, been on a couple independent movies here. But uh, the reason why I'm here today is because I'm a huge, huge nerd and I love Dungeons and Dragons so much. Some people may consider me somewhat of an expert at Dungeons and Dragons, but there's so much to learn about it that, you know, I feel like I've only still tips the kind of the iceberg on on what there is to know about this game. But some of you guys have a general idea of what D&D is about or what it is. Does anyone want to like just kind of describe what they think D&D is? Dungeons and Dragons. Sure, that's the right. Dungeons and Dragons. Yes, that's the name of the game. But what is the, what would you say? Like, how do you describe the game? I describe it as a way of like using your imagination as well as like having fun or what being characters you never get the chance to be play as like an elf or anything like that. Fantasy character. Yeah, yeah. Role playing, role playing, like kind of like this medieval fantasy world. So, like something where, where magic exists, you yeah, know? Crazy adventure. Yeah, having a lot of fun. Maybe like rolling the dice also, mm-hmm. like to like get a turn. Yeah, yeah. So, rolling the dice. So, there's a game aspect to it too. So, like you've got this storytelling aspect to it, this like creative approach, this role playing aspect to it. But there's also a mechanics based aspect to it, which is like the rolling the dice, adding some of the numbers. There's a structure to it. So, I'd actually combine the two and say that that D is this tabletop role playing experience. It's probably the most popular one today. It's one of the first ones ever created, this system, this RPG, to kind of make a structured storytelling experience as a game for people at at a table. So I love it. I absolutely love it. I bet a lot of you guys, I've already talked to a bunch of you guys about video games, like anime and TV and stuff like that. One of the reasons why I love this game so much, unlike video games, you're sitting at the table with a bunch of your friends and you're telling a story together. You're using your own brain, your own passion, your own creativity to kind of come up with this story together at the table. And you just can't do that with the video game. There's like, we talked about rails earlier, right? The video games, there's a set programming and code into them. Now, as, as expansive as a world can be within a video game, like an open world RPG, there's still a set amount of parameters. When you're at the table with your friends and it's just you and you're making your imagination make believe, there's no limits. The only limit is yourself and what you're allowing to happen at the table. And I think that to me, that's a lot of fun. It scratches my actor itch. I don't get a lot of times <laughs> now to like go and role play like out in the world professionally mm-hmm. anymore, but I could do that with my friends and I can I can have, you know, I can be an elf. I can be like this like dumb barbarian if I want to. I can do whatever I want, have fun with it. And it's a very low stakes like acting challenge and a lot of people are just there to have fun. So I absolutely love the game. So D&D is uh, the most popular game today. It's created in like the early 70s for a guy named Gary Gygax, actually in Lake Geneva. Yeah. So it's not too far from here is where the, the game was actually created. All right. There's a bunch of mechanics in the game, but you don't you don't necessarily need to know them. Just get started playing. You can just kind of like get yourself into a story and then the DM or the dungeon master who kind of runs the games can help guide along new players to kind of learn how to play. So does everyone know what Twitch here is? Like YouTube and stuff like that? Yes. Nice. Cool. Okay. Yeah. We got some, I heard we have a streamer here, right? A YouTuber. So partly because of streaming today through Twitch and YouTube, the game is the most popular it's ever been. Actually in like 2017, there's like 8.6 million Americans playing D&D in 2017 alone, okay? And 9 million Americans were watching it 
uh, watching other people play it on Twitch or YouTube. So it's a great time to learn how to play the game. There's a lot of resources in order for you to learn how to play the game. You can watch other people do it. And oftentimes, it's going to be entertaining. It's a story. You're watching TV, essentially. People make up a, like an episode of TV on the spot and having fun doing it. So it's a fantastic game. But in short, what does it look like to play at the table? Okay, so what, basically we separate it between players and DM. As a player, you're in charge of your character only. You'll create your character, and you'll you know you can be like a martial like type like fighter, a barbarian. You can like be a magic user, uh, be like a wizard or a sorcerer. You can be like a healing type, like a cleric or something like that. But um, adding that flavor, which is this like that narrative text to like uh, describing an attack or describing the way your character looks or feels, is another cool component of the game because it, it makes adds that unique spin that is you. All of you guys have your own creativity that you get to add to the character and that's like 75% of the fun is like being able to add your personality or something that you, something that is a part of you and like role play that out at a table and just have fun and explore that part of yourself. Maybe you're super shy, you start playing a character at the table, maybe you're super shy in person, but maybe your character at the table is this confident braggart, you know? And you get suddenly, like, you get more and more exposure to being able to do that at the table with your friends and comfortable. And who knows? Maybe that seeps out into your real life. So and are, that happens all the time. You said that there was, like, rules. But what are, like, the rules that for D&D that you said that you have to follow them? But I thought you said you go with imagination. So what, what are the guidelines? So these are the guidelines. So the players will play. They're in charge of their characters, right? They're in charge of their characters responding to situations that the DM presents in front of them. The DM is in charge of everything else. Non-player characters, so these are the characters that your, your player characters will interact with in the world. Quest givers, like enemies, all these type of people that you see like in video games too. The DM's in charge of acting them out or just describing what they look like. The DM is also in charge of like creating a session, writing the quests out that you're gonna be experiencing together at the table or like even building out the world in general, right? So when I say world, Think about like Westeros from Game of Thrones or think about Middle Earth from Lord of the Rings. These are settings. So the DM can create their own settings or they can use one that's purchased for them from Wizards of the Coast, which is like the creator, creators of D&D. Did you have a question? And what about D&D dragons? All types of dragons can do a lot of stealing gold and give energy of their powers. Mm-hmm. So, like, typically dragons will likely be your enemies or your allies. You're usually not a master of it, but that, that can happen. So, like, in D&D, dragons have a certain, like, based on their, their scale color. It can be metallic or chromatic. Uh, metallic tend to be, like, good dragons, and chromatic tend to be, like, bad dragons. Yeah. I have a question. So, for the DM, so is he, like, a deity, or he's, like, a certain character within, like, uh, D&D? The DM? Yeah. So the DM, Dungeon Master, right, uh, in charge of the game. So think of him as like a third, like like a, a, a faceless entity, right? You know, like I am me, Andrew, I am the DM, but I take on so many different roles. You're the arbiter of the game. It's up to you as a DM to structure the game, to make rule decisions. So like when there's something in the rules, when a player does something and you need to find a way to like, how do I translate their action trying to sneak past a guard into a really heavily fortified castle? You know, how do I, as the DM, make a rule calling on how to use the dice and their character sheet to determine if they're successful or if they fail at that? And then it's like, well, I know that that requires a stealth skill. A lot of RPGs are based off this, like, system. A lot of the, all the RPGs that we play in video games have been structured off a lot of the, the themes and, like, core components of this game. So. So I know you mentioned the, the general rules so the dungeon master for each individual game creates their own set of rules so there are three different books that you need to kind of play this game it is the dungeon master's guide which is only for the dungeon master that contains a whole bunch of rules that's for the dm to help guide them along in like making rules calls this includes information about like the different ways to play the different themes of dnd that you can play so you think about like sword and sorcery which is like uh, a type of theme where it's like mostly just about 
going around and like killing monsters with swords and not necessarily like a lot of like strong story building necessarily. You've got things like intrigue type games where it's like about court politics and you're playing like a spy mission or something like that. That's like an intrigue mission. So maybe you as a DM are like, I want to run this type of session where I want my characters to be like infiltrating like a ball or something like that to get information about like a king's king's treason or something like that. So getting these all, it's like subterfuge versus, you know, knocking down doors and killing monsters and stuff like that. Okay. So DM has the final kind of say on, on rules when it comes to like kind of figuring out how to arbitrate something. So they'll come up with like, I guess the setting and like kind of the structure of, of the game, but it's really a, a kind of a collaborative effort between the players and the DM to kind of push a story along. Just because the DM is basically the world that faces the, the players, and the players are the ones that are kind of um, going about and exploring it, and it's up to them to kind of go after that, that exciting quest and everything. But I can talk about this all day. I can talk about, like, what it's like. You're probably going to learn a little bit more if we actually, like, play a little bit real briefly. So, like, who, who are my players? I can have about maybe three to four players. Raise your hand high. So we've got Gennaro, Brandon, Justice, Jonas, D'Angelo. Did you want to play? And D'Angelo to your left. Okay, great. Okay, so I've got some dice here. Mm-hmm. We're just gonna play like a real brief, mm-hmm. real brief session. And then is that everybody? As I mentioned, the player characters will be presented some sort of situation that they need to get past. Think about problem, think about an obstacle, you need to find a creative way to get past mm-hmm. it, or maybe there's a, a surefire way, like swinging your sword to get past a goblin or something like that, right? An easy way without knowing any of the rules to play this game is to think about what the character would do in that sort of situation and just respond in how you're you're going to react. Then it's me up to me as a DM to tell you, okay, roll this die and add this number based on what your character is good at. So like think of like this knight, right? Big strong knight is probably gonna be really good at like bashing things. You're probably gonna have a good athletic skill, a good strength score. So it's gonna be a lot easier for them to lift something or like bash open a door, while as uh, like a nerdy wizard, right? Uh, a bookish wizard probably is not gonna be very strong because they spend most of their time learning how to read and learning how to cast magic and stuff like that, okay? So these are kind of the calls that you kind of, the, the stats and stuff that you think about when you're kind of creating a character. Most of the, the die rolls that you're gonna use, that you're gonna to have to do, are gonna to have to deal with this, this 20-sided die or a mm-hmm. D20. All right, this is the primary die you're gonna roll to determine if something that you wanna do is successful or if it fails, okay? So you roll that, everyone just give it a good roll right now. Just give a good D20 roll. 13. 13. 13. Good. So essentially, nice, nice. So you essentially want a high number, okay? Whenever you try to do something as a character, and I, I as a DM present something to you, I'm often gonna think of a number in my head based on uh, the higher the number that is in my head is probably the more difficult the task is that you're trying to beat, right? So you think about making a meal, right? Think about making a meal. Putting toast uh, in a toaster as a human, right? No skill at all. You know, if you try to do that as a character in the game, I probably wouldn't make you roll. However, if you're making like a Thanksgiving meal and you're not trained to do this and you're doing that in game, I'd probably make you roll and probably the, the DC or the difficulty class the DM is proposing to you, it's going to be pretty high. It's probably going to be like like a 20. So you need to beat a 20. If you count on how many numbers on here on a 20-sided dice, there's only 20 numbers on here, right? So you need to get that 20. But if you're skilled at doing this sort of thing, if you have like a plus five to cooking because you're trained in cooking, you get to add a special number to that die. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm-hmm. If you're good at something, you should get a bonus for it, right? Yes. Yeah, it makes sense. You or- should... A plus or S plus yeah. from the games. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And there's going to be said, these, as you go about and play this game, each of these players have a different class. Uh, there's a different type of, of role that you fill as a knight, as a wizard, as like a priest type character, like a cleric. You have a different role, just m- much like, like you playing a basketball team or a soccer team. There's different positions that you play, so you're better at certain things than other people, and that's why you're kind of like specialized in that area. So let's say, D'Angelo, what type of character would you like to be? Think about, like, do you want to wield a sword? Do you want to use magic? Do you want to have a bow and arrow? What do you think? Um, I want to go with the um, the magic sword. You want to use the magic sword? Yes. Okay, we'll say that you yeah, you have a sword. You're, like, come over, like, a like magic knight character. Okay, you're a fighter. What's your name again? Jonas. Jonas. What type of character would you like to, to, to be? 
let's see, a warrior. So maybe you want like a crossbow? And then Justice, right, was that your name? Yeah. Um, what type of character would you like to use? Uh, a magic user. You want to be a magic user. Okay, we'll say that you're the wizard, all right? And we'll say that you can use fire for now, okay? And what was your name again? Brandon. Brandon, what type of character would you like to be? I want to be a dual wielding sword. A dual, so you're gonna, okay, I'm gonna let you be like kind of like a sneakier, like rogue type character, okay? Mm. You're like more lithe and you don't have a big sword like, like this character over yeah. here. You probably have two swords, yeah. right? So they're smaller and you're right. able to like, quicker. be the quicker. Yes. Right, excellent. Okay, and then what type of character would you like to be? An assassin. An assassin, okay, so maybe you guys, I'm just making this up right now. Maybe you guys are like in the same guild or something like that. Maybe you're both like thievish, roguish types, <laughs> right? And you guys are all part of what's called a party, okay? There's five of you playing right now. I'm the DM, I'm giving you a situation. So we've got kind of like a strong knight over here with a mixture of magic. He maybe turn his sword on fire if he wants to. We have kind of this, this ranged like soldier type with a crossbow. We've got kind of the bookish wizard over here, master of arcane magics. Okay, he's got a spell book and a robe, uh, and he knows how to use fire. And then we've got the kind of like, oh, maybe twin, uh, twin roguish, thievish types, okay? All of you guys have been summoned together to a tavern by your friend. We'll say that his name is Theoden Bronzebottom. He's a dwarf, okay? We are in uh, the sword coast of a continent called Faerun. Okay, we're in the setting of the Forgotten Realms, which is kind of like the standard setting of D&D. You guys have all been summoned here by Theoden, and he's giving you guys an epic quest he wants your help with. Why he's chosen you? Because you guys maybe have some sort of connection to him. Maybe he knows your guilt in some sort of way, and he's hired you. You guys know these guys from past jobs, and so you've brought them along for this, okay? <laughs> Theoden explains to you that there is this lost mine of Fandelver. Okay, this is something that's been lost the ages. Back hundreds of years ago, it was a forge for enchanted weapons, for axes and armors, and it was used to help stay uh, an orcish invasion in the past. Okay, this has been lost the ages since this orcish invasion has destroyed it. No one has known where the whereabouts is of this mine has been has gone to, except for Theoden. Theoden has uncovered a map, and he wants your help in order to find this place. It might be a dangerous mission. There's likely going to be baddies along the way and an investigation to, to uncover the whereabouts of this mine. But he trusts you guys. And upon successful completion of this mission, each of you will get 50 gold pieces and likely more ability to stretch out the networks that Thaden has to get even more jobs along the way. But first off, you have to get to the small town of Fandolin. Okay, he's going to meet you there. He's going to meet you with his two brothers and another knight. His name's Sir Godfrey, okay? Sir Godfrey's going to meet you there, and you guys are going to go depart from this town. All of you together walking from the town of Waterdeep, this metropolis on the Sword Coast. You guys turn off the trade road and go into this small, small thicket. Does everyone know what a thicket is? It's basically like a small forest, like thick like weeds and, and, and bramble and stuff. There's also some tall trees, but basically just to say that you're along this narrow road, this like footpath, that's not like a major road anymore. It's something that's just been traversed by people on foot and horses, and it's now created this like natural road, okay? So you guys are traversing along the knight, the two thieves, the wizard, and kind of the ranged uh, crossbow wielder over here. And you see in front of you, about 150 feet away, you see two horses lying on their sides in the middle of the road. You look to the back of you, you look past them, there seems to be nothing there. It's quiet. Every now and then you'll hear the chirping of a bird in the distance, the rustling of some, some leaves. What do you do? I'll approach it carefully. You approach it carefully. Okay. Does everyone does everyone like that plan? Yeah. Okay. Is everyone gonna go in at the same time or are you gonna try to go in by yourself? I'll go in by myself. Does everyone follow with that plan, or do you want to go in with him? I'll go in with him. Okay. Okay, so three of you are going to go in. So you guys you guys are going to hold back right here. I need you three to roll what's called a stealth check. Okay? So get that D20 out, right? This thing right here? Yep. That's one. That's one. And we'll say that you're all fairly good at this. So add a plus one on top of it. So roll it. What did you get? Seven. seven, so add a plus one to it. So just add seven plus one. Seven, so I got a seven. 
Please my number. Seven. Natural 20. Okay, that's really good. Okay, so you got a seven. You had an eight plus one, so you got a six on the die, plus one is seven, and then you got a, what's called a natural 20. Uh, you've rolled the highest possible d- number on the die, which means most things will automatically pass because you've rolled so high. Uh, in this case, it won't, for circumstances it won't get into, but you rolled really well. So 21 for him. So the train thieves, right? The train, like, assassin-type characters kind of go forward while this guy uh, over here with the crossbow kind of um, goes ahead of you and is able to quickly approach the horses without any noise. You get, he's so quick and so stealthy that you guys don't even notice that he's in front of you. Along the way, uh, you don't even notice as a, a root kind of like is on the ground, on the road, that you failed to notice previously, and one of you trips over it, causing a whole bunch of ruckus. The two that kind of remain behind, you see this happen, and you start to hear from the bushes some voices. And then... That doesn't scare me. It doesn't scare you? Me. Suddenly, a, a, an, an arrow flies towards you um, and hits right below the ground, and you start to see as a two green skin goblins are busy kind of like readying their next their next attacks towards you guys what do you do you guys want to fight back right you guys want to you guys want to protect what's going on back. great okay cool so we'll say how do you how do you approach this what do you do you see this you see they're like kind of in the in the bush okay cool okay so do you want to approach them and fight these guys over here what are you guys doing magic sword flame wielding guy what are you doing do you want to attack these goblins? Yes. Yes. Okay. And in the back, the wizard. What are you doing? You can you can kind of see the whole battlefield, right? What would you like to do with them? You got that fire, that fire power. If you like, you have a flame spell. You can cast towards them if you want to. Uh, I do a blaze spell. You do cool, sweet. <laughs> okay. So since you rolled so high, we'll say that you're going to be able to go first, and we'll just go around the table, and you guys can all take a turn at this. And then in the middle of this somewhere, the goblins are going to get a couple of attacks on you guys, okay? So you turn around, you see the goblin. He's kind of readying his next arrow. You're going to get your crossbow out, and you're going to sh- try to shoot him. Okay, roll that d20 again. You're good at, at this crossbow thing, so add a plus three to this. Ready? Okay. Plus three? Yeah. I'm natural 20. <laughs> so in an attack scenario like this, a natural 20 means it's an auto hit, okay? So get that D6, right? That six-sided dice, this one. Okay, he did a crit. So normally what you do, you just roll it once. Roll the six for damage. Okay. It's a five. I'm going to see because you're really good at this. So you get to add a plus three to it. So that's eight. Since you crit, he gets to roll it again. So roll that D6 one more time. That's great. So that's 13 points of damage. So you see, you, you like with this expert reaction, they fire towards you and they don't realize what they just got themselves into. You quickly spin around, you load a, a bolt in your crossbow, and then what? What are you aiming for? The target. The target, but where in the, the target? In the goblin? Is there a specific area you want to hit? The head, the body. The... Actually, the head. The head, okay. That's their weakness. Yeah, everyone's weakness is their head, right? <laughs> so you spin around, you get the bolt, and you you fire straight. And it's it just you just like you've always been trained. You let that, that air go. Mm-hmm. You release the bolt straight through the head. The goblin. <laughs> and falls straight down on the floor. There's only one goblin left. Amazing. Okay, right here, wizard justice. Do you want to? You want to do your fire spell, right? Yeah. You see, is the other goblin who just saw his friend fall on the ground an expert shot from your companion. It starts beginning to run away, and you want to throw a fire spell at him. Go ahead and roll that d20. Add a plus three to it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Only natural twenties. <laughs> do me a favor. It's a magic. It's a magic spell. So you're gonna do the same thing, right? So get get this ten sided die right here. Okay, and roll that one twice for me. Twice because you crit, right? Roll it. It's a six. Okay, and roll it one more time and add it together. Okay, so seven points of damage. Right, so this uh, this big fireball, you kind of summon it in your hands, and you kind of toss it like a like a baseball uh, right towards this goblin. And it kind of gets him as he runs away. You see that his clothing catches on fire, and he kind of stumbles a little bit with some of the the brush around him starting to catch fire. It's your turn. What are you doing? There's one goblin left because your your companion just uh, instantly killed it. Uh, There's one goblin on the like trying to run away. He's partly on fire. 
I throw my sword. At you him. throw your sword at it? Do you throw a dagger maybe instead? Yeah. It's a little bit easier to throw? Okay, so roll your d20, add plus three to it. Okay, that's a 10. So you throw your dagger out towards it. You're still on the ground, kind of like recovering from stumbling over the, the root, right? So you grab a, a dagger from your side pocket here and you just quickly throw it out towards him. He's able to just, as he's trying to put out the fire, he's able just luckily able to like, just stop, drop and roll. The dagger like flies past him. And unfortunately you're not able to hit him. It's your turn, what are you doing? I'm gonna teleport in front of him and slice his chest Okay. Through. We'll say that you can run really fast. You're really low level. You're level one, so you probably can't teleport yet, but you're super fast still, so you can get up to him and you can try to you can try to stab him if you'd like. All right. Okay, so roll that d20. Okay, uh, and so plus three, because you're really good at this. Something about it, you're not able to. Why, in this case, why don't you think you hit him? What happened? It missed. It missed. Okay. Again, so you go out there and you try to. You you think you're going to get him. You're you're about to stab him right through, and he's able to roll. He sees you coming. He he rolls the other way as he stop at dropping and rolling, trying to put out the wizard's fire spell. Your big guys are both right next to him now, so it's going to be hard for him to escape. It's your turn now, sir. What would you like to do? You got your magic fire sword. You can see your buddies around the the one goblin that's kind of on fire. You also don't have to end this by killing him. You could do something else. What would be a good reason for keeping him alive? Investigating who he's from and what, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you could also kill him if you want to. Yeah, <laughs> it's up to you. D'Angelo, do you want to kill the goblin or do you want to capture him and see if you can find out some information? I will kill the goblin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, you, did, so you, you rolled the 11. I saw you rolled the 11. Plus three is 14. That's enough to beat what's oh, called his armor class. Okay. Okay, that's the biggest dice you can roll besides the d20. It's going to do the most damage. And then you'll add plus three to the damage roll of this. Cool. Okay, did you light your sword on fire? Yes. Great. So you charge forward. You have your big sword. Is it a two-handed sword or is it like a one-handed sword? It's a two-handed sword. Two-handed sword. You charge forward. You you say that magic word, Tarkaris, and the whole big broadsword just bursts onto fi- into fire and flames, and you swing it right over the goblin. You cut off his head with the rest of his body just going immediately to charred ash. And now you've successfully successfully uh, safeguarded this area and can investigate it should we have more time to do this. But we don't. But that's a little that's a little bit about like how how this session might work out. So you guys get some decisions. I kind of respond to them. We can try to like add some flavor to kind of like set you. Do you guys feel like you were there for a little bit? Yeah. yeah. You guys feel like you were in that thicket. You were like yeah. you had a little bit. So that's that's the, that's the great thing about this game is that you can insert yourself into the story and start. You know, if we had more time, we would be able to like really flesh out these characters. But yeah, do you had one question? Yeah. Why did uh, the goblin. Why can't like be partners? So you guys could have talked to the goblins if you wanted to, right? <laughs> That's the thing. Like we have options. I'm not gonna be his partner. And help him out. <laughs> well, one of the one of the one of the funny things, or not the funny things, is but like what some people do is that you know we we have these certain we have these certain prejudices against like certain monsters like orcs and goblins because what we've read in fantasy, but that we don't as a DM, you know, it's up to you if you want to like run with those prejudices or if you want to make that type of. So who put Race. you into D and D? How did you get? One of my friends. One of my friends got me into it, and it's it's been a natural fit ever since. I don't think we're gonna have enough time to do character creation, but essentially, when you're doing character creation, there are there are some certain stats that you're trying to trying to fill out, right? So there's strength, dexterity, constitution, wisdom, intelligence, and then charisma. Right, and so you want to think about what makes uh, a certain human like what you're good at, right? And then certain classes, one of these stats be most important to them. So strength, what will you think about that as like the what we can like lift and like our athletic ability, yeah. dexterity. We're thinking about that as like speed or like our ability to be agile. When I think about thieves and stuff, I think about them having a high dex score because they need to be able to have like a good sleight of hand if they're stealing something or like picking a lock or something. They need to be dexterous like that. Constitution. How much damage you can take, or like when you think about even in everyday life, when you're trying to like if you're sick and you're trying not to vomit, maybe you have a high constitution score because you're able to like hold that, that you have the wherewithal to hold that in if you need to. Uh, wisdom, you want to think of this more about like you know at a very basic level, common sense. At a higher level, like uh, spiritual awareness, stuff like that. 
intelligence. We're thinking about like book smarts, knowledge, being able to train like this. Wizards, right? Like Justice Play is a wizard. They have a high intelligence score because they need to be able to decipher arcane, ancient knowledge in order to manifest <coughs> things like fire and, and stuff from thin air. Charisma, we're talking about people that can just like actors or people that be able to communicate in a social sit- setting, being able to have just a natural natural factor that that's makes people like you. So right. you can only have one of these in the strong. No, you're basically going to have, uh, you want to have some sort of balance between these, but certain characters, like if you're a spellcaster, a certain ability will be most important of this. So a, a certain combination of all these scores will warrant a character. And on top of that, there are classes, right? So we think about martial classes, fighters, barbarians, we think about magic users like wizards, Sorcerers, where sorcerers are more charisma based because they were born with this power, right? Where wizards trained for it. Bards are like kind of actors or like storytellers that kind of use their words and stories to create spells. Okay, that's just a quick dive into character creation. So, how do you explain character alignment, especially like lawful good and like neutral good and everything like that? Yeah. Great question. This is something that is very specific to D&D. We think of alignment as a cross-section between lawful, right, neutral, and then chaotic. And then you think of good, neutral, and then evil, right? And we have this, like, cross-section here. So you think of, like, whether people, how people, like, basically interact with society, right? Are they a rules follower in some sort of way? Lawful? Do they fit in with society? Do they do they not really care either way? Chaotic? Are they constantly going against the rules, whether it's good for good or evil? Okay? And you've got good, like a lawful good character is like a knight who is especially good uh, at following the rules and also has a high morality, right? So you think about this section as morality. Neutral good, someone that doesn't really care about society but is good morally. Chaotic good, think about like people that go against the system but have good intentions. So you think about sometimes like rebels. I think like Robin Hood is a good chaotic good character going against the sheriff in Nottingham in the kingdom because he's helping the poor even though he's robbing from the rich. He's subverting the kind of society in order to do like a, a good deed. You think about chaotic evil, someone that is just like nuts. Think about the Joker from Batman, who's almost doing evil just for evil's sake. That's like a, cha- a chaotic evil type character, okay? Does a lawful good person can turn into like chaotic evil? Can they? Yes. So that's going to be up to the player at the table, how their character goes on a journey. So as you, much like you are in real life, like you will change over time. Your character can change over time too. Whether or not you want to like actually... Like label that with a alignment change is a conversation between you and the DM for your character, but it's not something necessary that has to happen. You can do that just by simply acting and being uh, your character at the table. Okay, so my question is, uh, where do we play it on? It's not in like App Store. How do you play it? Yeah. Okay, so it's not a video game. That's the best part about it, right? It's these books that I brought for you guys to kind of look today. I'll look at today. There's the Player's Handbook, there's the Monster Manual, and there's the Dungeon Master's Guide. These are the three books that are like kind of the core materials in order for you to to play the game. All right. The players just need the, the player's handbook to create their character and like know the rules of the game. Or well, the dungeon master needs the other two to be able to create a session. But it's all imaginary. We're all sitting at a table playing this with dice and our imaginations. And that's the best part about it is that you don't need a screen. You just need people that are willing to create and roll some dice together. It's kind of like a structured, it's a structured improv, uh, improvisation storytelling game. How can you invite other people to play it? Great. Yeah. So you can, in person, I was the best way to play. You can go to game stores. I believe you guys went to like a a comic book store or like a, like a a hobby store that had probably some sort of organized play there. Wizards of the Coast does have, Wizards of the Coast being the company that created this game and runs the game, does have something called Adventurers. This is a organized play where you can go and meet other people that play the game, and they might do it like on a weekly basis or something like that. I know there's a there's a couple of stores called the, the Dice Dojo. There's one on the north side, there's one on the south side. They will probably have like a weekly night to play. People will go and help you, and you can take that character to any of these type of games. I would suggest going to uh, www.dnd.wizards.com and going to that to their website and kind of getting more information. There's some free materials there where you can grab like the basic rule set, like the starter set, and download some like pre-made characters, and you can just start playing right away. There's a very low cost entry 
to this game too. And you can spend as much as you want to get like fancy miniatures and stuff like that. But you can play, you can split the three books amongst a group and have everything you need to, to start a game like right away. For a person who has to do the math, does it only require for the DM to do it or do you make your players do it on themselves too? As a DM, as as much as you can like pass things off to your players to, to handle, character creation should be hap- happening by the players. But DMs have a lot on their plate. Anything they can do to kind of delegate will be good for them and the group. And also, it's always good to have a collaborative spirit at the table. What are the different types of DMs you've encountered besides yourself? So I have I've played with DMs that are really good storytellers, and they've like created a table where I really just love to like listen to the story. Like I feel like I'm a part of it, and my characters have a good part in the world. But sometimes they're inflexible, so like my my actions don't really matter because they're this is like a, a written yeah, book. End up like that, yeah. But it ends up being okay because I really like the way they tell the story. I've also played where uh, a DM is just not as descriptive or as uh, invested in the story or makes it seem like like the players, like no matter what they do, like adding like a description is like, what sounds fun? Like, like I roll to attack and I hit him or, you know, I pick up my blade and I spin it around my head and I slice him across from, from shoulder yeah. to shoulder. Like that sounds fun to me. I love to describe that as a yeah, player. Right. But as a DM, they're like, okay, just roll, just roll. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, there's a play, there's a time and place for that. But like for me as a DM, I want to be able to give my players that liberty to do that so they so can you, have fun. So you think of yourself like the middle ground? You're- I think of myself as middle ground. And my last question is, what was your first character since you weren't a DM in the beginning? <laughs> what was your very first character that you were? Yeah, I was a half elf monk. At the time, I was personally, Andrew was into kind of mixed martial arts. So like I was like, like, oh, let me just find, I know how to like describe like an axe kick or like a roundhouse kick. So like, it'd be good to be able to be a monk in this game. And I, I found it a lot, really enjoyable. I played that character for a while. His name was Raylid. Uh, he was a half elf monk. And he was more like specially good at like pressure points and like stunning enemies and stuff like that. So it's very, it was very unique to the party that we were playing with at the time. I had a lot of fun with him. Well... Tell me more about your podcast. Yeah. I have a group of friends and I that we we have a podcast of our own. It's an actual play podcast, which means that we were actually playing the game live for you guys to kind of listen to and follow along. That's called Variant Rules. One of my kind of like cohort and teammates that, that helped run the podcast created a brand new system. We basically on the podcast are testing the game out while also providing a narrative structure for people to like kind of listen to. We also have a... Uh, a component where we talk about the, the mechanics of the game so you kind of learn how to play the game by us talking about it and also learn how to play the game by just observing us observing us play. Who is Dungeons and Dragons? So there's a company called Wizards of the Coast that it's like publishing and creating this game. I would, I would encourage you to go visit them again, dnd.wizards.com. They have a lot of information on there. They also create the game Magic the Gathering, if you guys have heard of that. So Great games company. They've got a lot of products. d and I would say, is also a community in general, if we want to be, like, esoteric with that question. The streamers, the players, like, it's a very welcoming community. They want more players. You can find streamers constantly, like, doing the live games on Twitch and stuff. I would highly recommend you guys go find this streaming group called Critical Role. It's a bunch of, like, voice actors from Hollywood that are expert character creators and actors. And you can see them play this like really epic game online. You can watch them play it. You can also have a podcast, Critical Role. I would say go look at that. And then also another one called uh, The Adventure Zone is a podcast. It's more of a comedian-based uh, RPG podcast. So they're like not necessarily playing the game correctly, but they use the game to tell jokes and stuff, which is just another way to play the game, which I really enjoy. How could my characters more unstoppable an unstoppable character so there there is a method to character creation called min maxing right which is basically about trying to gain the system as much as you can to make this absolute strongest character which depending on the type of game you're playing i would just say allocating your your scores your stats right the strength dexterity constitution into the usually three to four fields are going to be more most relevant to your character but there is a certain threshold to your power level as a character you're not going to be able to like be a god, you know, at level one or two. It just depends. You will likely be have a lot more fun like experimenting with failure in D and D, because honestly, like I know, I know he's shaking your head no, but failure can be fun and failure can lead to interesting situations in this game and also creative solutions 
And I think that's the strongest part of this game is that you have to think outside the box sometimes. Sometimes the uh, the most creative player will subvert a situation where you know you're you're weak and you have to use violence, and you can find another way to solve a problem, which actually helps build real life skills as well. I would just hope that you guys just go out and, and find these materials and and learn how to play. I would suggest playing with each other at a table. Someone, if you if you wanted to, to be a DM and just taking the initiative to do it, you don't need a lot of experience to start one. Sometimes I would just like listen to a podcast and then just give it a shot. And I think you guys will find it to be very enjoyable and it might end up being like a really like good lifelong hobby. How Your Story podcast was produced by students at Ray Graham Training Center High School in Chicago with the support of After School Matters. Our advisors are Miss Andrea Klunder and Edwin Ruiz at the Creator Imposter Studios. We are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at Power Your Story Podcast. Our website is PowerYourStoryPodcast.com. Thank you for listening. And be true to yourself. 